I would love to. I'd love to see what I would have been like. Killian James Fitzgerald. Whilst we were both in Limerick one weekend to be interviewed for this podcast, and I use the term interview very lightly, it was a conversation amongst friends who haven't seen or truly spoken together, connected in years. A little bit of backstory, myself and Killian grew up together in the theatre scene in Limerick, and we, we went our separate ways, but our paths always crossed here and there. It was lovely to get to sit down with an old friend and talk the deep philosophical existential moments of our life and then waffle and go on tangents. But good morning, good evening, good afternoon, good night, friends, wherever you are in the world. I hope you're having a good day and the day you deserve. Today on the podcast, we have Killian James Fitzgerald. He has been involved in the performing arts for over 20 years on and off the stage, not only in acting in front of an audience or camera, but he has taken many roles behind as a stage manager, front of house, props manager, choreographer, producer, and so much more. But to be honest, as Killian Affley says, all the world is a stage. So let's get into the podcast. I finished my fucking acting career. Literally walked out of the room crying. I couldn't fucking handle it. <laughs> Why? What? Why? Shakespeare. Oh my god. Because of Macbeth. It wasn't just Macbeth. It was Shakespeare in general. In general, why? Oh, go on. Just please the, tell me. No, it was just the language. Do you know, like in acting it out. I was like, what the fuck am I saying? <laughs> Do you know what I mean? See me now, like with my hands. Like literally, I am devoted. I love reading. I I have books on sonnets that I will just read for fun. Mm-hmm. What is it about Shakespeare that kind of has that drawback for you? Because I have that with so many other freaking playwrights that I just cannot read. Well, for me, well, it's when I first approached it, um, you know, always musical theatre was always panto. It was always, you know, I was um, a host or a performer, a presenter. So it was always, you know, to the audience and ah, da, 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 da. But then it was just like literally Shakespeare is just so serious. And then it's just the language and everything, like literally <laughs> trying to, I was like in rehearsals, like literally like speak, trying to speak the dialogue and I didn't have a fucking clue what I was fucking saying. Really? <laughs> yeah. Oh gosh. Okay. Oh, stop. But like, you know, it was, it was during college as well. So like the pressure of every day in rehearsals, all, it was like journals and the whole lot. And How did you find that experience journaling? Like... I will bring you up to my office now and you will see a full shelf of like yeah. thick bound leather journals and you're like, Stuart, what do you write in these? And I'm like, I don't know. How do you find journaling for theatre or acting in general? Well, like since college, so I haven't really, I haven't really done a production or anything to really journal about it. Really. To that level. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So Shakespeare does that to you. It's like you need to go very introspective. Yeah. But it was always kind of like, always at the start of the journal, we were like, so today we start off with the warm up and then I'll, I'd label all the techniques and whatever we'd done in the warm up. And then it was all like, today we did act one, scene three, and you know. It can get very, I felt what's the word? Like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know. It can get very monotonous sometimes, mm. especially with Shakespeare trying to go through it and then like delving into it and then delving delving into it and then like someone's perspective has to go against your perspective but anyway Killian besides Shakespeare and your loathsome for it give us an introduction to yourself okay so um I'm Killian performing since the very young age of eight years old and besides Acting, acting, like musical theatre is my passion. Um, a baritone vocalist. Um, so I've been, I've always been singing and stuff like that. So I enjoyed the singing part of acting as well and acting through song. And uh, yeah, it's just since a very young age of eight years old and doing Christmas panto. And uh Tell us about your bleach blonde hair and your icy blue eyes for our audience. 
Newly single, looking for a relationship. Always. <laughs> oh. <laughs> um, oh, this, the blonde highlights thing, it's only like a once a year, kind of a season kind of a thing. <laughs> if you I'm, want him for the summer, friends, grab him right now because those blonde locks will be gone. <laughs> seriously like i have him in my kitchen because i tried to grab him as quickly as i could for this podcast i wanted him on an episode and yeah that's all i'm staring at right now are those bg blonde highlights and those icy blue eyes <laughs> but going apart from that <laughs> what kind of podcast is this turning into i don't know Stuart. um tell us uh tell me friend what inspired you to embark on this beautiful journey as a performer, as an actor, as a musical theatre practitioner, where did it all begin with you? Um, well, growing up um, in my family, um, my uncle, he's not with us anymore. He he died a number of years ago when I was very young, but he left Ireland when he was um, 19. So that was in like the late 80s, early 90s. So he studied acting in the UK, in Manchester, and... He was always like, um, he used to write a few songs as well. Um, not musical theatre as such, but he'd write songs. And then acting wise, studying acting and would have been uh, an extra in the background for Carnation Street and Hollyoaks and Brookside and all them. So that was from my uncle. And many years ago, when my mother was in work, um, there used to be a competition in Ireland called Tops of the Town. I know this. Yeah, go on. Okay, so, so this is a very prestigious competition that was about 20, 30 years ago? Indeed, yeah. So it was through my mother's uh, workplace in a factory that they were in the they were in the competition and Pat McGann was the director, as as we all know, Pat McGann. The costume, costume maker. maker. Okay, so for anyone that doesn't know, Pat McGann is a very famous costume maker here in Ireland. If you want a costume of any way, shape or form, Pat McGann will have a version for you or can make it for you. So here in the theatre community, if you don't have it, Pat McGann's got it. That's it. <laughs> so yeah, so with my mother anyway, she was... She was in the tops of the town competition back then and kind of she wasn't always on the stage or performing, but like later in life, then she kind of went back to like singing, being involved in the Limerick Gospel Choir. And now um, as a hobby, she's playing the ukulele. So she's kind of still kind of musically inclined. Yeah. <laughs> um. So, yeah. So that's my through my uncle and my mother. So you've had music in your family performance in your family yeah. since a very young age also have sport but i didn't kind of i only done sport in school so that i left that to my dad was an international rugby player for ireland so i left that to my sister so <laughs> very casually saying your dad was an international rugby player he was indeed <laughs> okay and you left it to your sister so you found your interest she found hers and it was like very much against the grain of the boys like blue and the girls like pink kind of scenario <laughs> You like the music and she likes the sport. Mm -hmm. I love that. So what ignited the fire for you to express yourself? Like a family of sports enthusiasts and people who love and are devoted to music. Like you had a choice. What drew you to the music, to the musical, the performance side? Um, well, when I was so small and young as well, like my mother used to take me to to see a show like in theatre and stuff. So the first thing I ever went to see was Panto. Oh, oh gosh, go on. Robinson what was your first Crusoe um, with Limerick Panto Society with Martin King from Ireland AM. You're showing your age there, kid. <laughs> so that was the very first Panto I ever saw. The first Panto I ever saw was Aladdin. But this is where they use like a very a sparkly costume for the genie and a bowler hat that you got from the two euro shop and they spray painted it blue i don't know who was in the cast i just know it was limerick panto and a blue bowler hat and i think damien shaw was screaming etc etc <laughs> sorry that's going back but go on anyway i'm sorry i'm sorry oh, you're fine <laughs> <laughs> so yeah um and of course in the program as you know you know there's because the kids or like Spotlight, Expressive Arts, and we saw in the program, oh, Expressive Arts, Theatre School, it's in Villiers. So 
the year after Panto. Um, stage schools were so, they're still so popular, but I actually had to wait a whole year to, to join Expressive Arts as there was a waiting list. Oh, wow. So, yeah, so it was just going to the Panto, like, and then in the program saying, oh, there's a stage school. I want to go there. <laughs> Why? Very, very deep, very facetious question. But why did you want to go do something you saw on stage? Because I wanted to be on stage, of course. You wanted <laughs> like, to that, be on stage? That, that looks fun. <laughs> why did it look like fun? We're going very deep here now, if you don't <laughs> like it. This is, this is Stuart, like, going away from the questions. He finds the introspective. Let's... I suppose I just wanted to express myself. <laughs> you wanted to express yourself with a life on stage mm. a life of performance a life of rejection a life of encountering obstacles but finding success within yourself and a life your of building confidence a life of building confidence a life of building talent yeah. <laughs> and persistence so could you share like a time when you faced a significant challenge for your confidence that you overcame as an artist as a as an actor as a theater practitioner like we face rejection on the daily mm. multiple times like when they say you need a thick skin to be an actor or a performer you need a thick skin for sure um it's kind of twice really in my life um first time um i've always been involved in theater since i was eight in stage schools in panto um and there used to be a big musical theatre summer school in UL for years. Um, so that was always... I spent eight years going to that summer, same summer camp and doing two, uh, doing a show at the end of the two weeks. But um, for me, um, I think the older... Now that I've, I've more experience, I've went to college, but there was a time, even though I was in stage schools and panto... I was always, for a long time, I was always kind of in the back. You know, I was kind of like in the back row. And the challenges I faced uh, as a child, um, other lads like my age and stuff, for example, there was one year doing Snow White Panto. Um, we were like the 10 or, we were like 12 or 13. And we were the teenage cores and then the seven dwarfs we had to play the seven dwarfs and then things like this this really hurt me as a child as well that that all the boys that were in the teenage chorus and some of the girls they all played a dwarf but I never got to play a dwarf so that was kind of that was kind of a, an upsetting time and then throughout the years um, I'm not going to mention their name now and everything but there was this other lad who was the same age as me and every year with auditions or if we had to read a script or if we had to sing a line of a song it was always down to the two of us mm -hmm. and they always got that speaking role they always got that singing role and I never I never got there and even I remember the last production that I'd done with them again we were like this was when we were 16, 17, and it was a, a, it was a leading role. Do you know the musical Hairspray? Yeah, I do. So one of my dream roles in musical theatre is to play the mother. And that <sighs> same lad for years, do you know, it was always down to the two of us. Yeah. And of course... It came down to the two of you again? It came down to the two of us again, and oh. lo and behold... <laughs> do you put that down to talent... Um, persistence or just that day and there with those people um, for me it was fear as well kind of I suppose um, I grew up like having a mild learning disability so I think when it came to having mm -hmm. to sing or do a piece of dialogue you could my, feel the nerves the nerves yeah. my stomach um, I used to be I what if I can't, what if I can't say the word? What if I can't say the word? So every time when I had to read a piece and if I said the word wrong, they would always correct me and say the words, but it always used to just bring me right down. right down. 
see from a person who's performed with you on stage like I've never known that mm -hmm. how did you overcome that type of fear or that lack of self-confidence um, because the amount of auditions you go into it that you could F up and flub words and still continue on like you're told continue like act as though you did nothing wrong if you're on stage you're the only one that knows you've messed up mm -hmm. how did you get to that point um, well I, I still continued on for such a long time and and that was still kind of happening as a young age anyway. So I spent kind of years kind of, um, I spent kind of years kind of st still staying in the background or just carrying on. And, and that's when, when I was like, when I was still young, 15, 12, that's when, when I wasn't on stage, I was working a stage crew and kind of doing other things as well, just to. You were 15 in Limerick Youth Theatre with me. Mm. So you weren't backstage, you were on stage. I was I was working on props for Faust, so I was working backstage for that one. Who were you? Mm. What was I in Faust? So, no, you were topless. I was top oh great. You thank mask. you. Thank you for <laughs> mentioning that. What was Stuart's was it like a monkey his teenage or years? He was a shirtless masked monkey. Yeah. Why? I don't know. We just wanted to put Stuart shirtless for some reason. Wow, it it does not sound any different to what I now get <laughs> in terms of roles. Oh, brilliant. Um So, yeah, I think what helped me, though, as well, um, growing up in... When I was in school, mm -hmm. so my school show... I used to be in the school shows, and we we done shows like Oliver. So I, I got to be, like, Mr. Bumble. Um, so that was, like... I always had like not everyone in my school had the stage or theater background so it was like for me if all the teachers or whatever oh my god he's glowing he's he's well able for that I was I was giving it my all I was performing I loved it you're in your element I was in my element that's the one um so growing up in school like it was kind of a thing like where it was like two separate kind of areas so when I was doing when I was in stage school or doing panto and doing shows out of school, not, uh, not everyone I, I was going with there were in my school. Yeah. So I kind of, I felt like I was more free to just... Be yourself. Just be myself and do it in school as well. So kind of school gave me the platform to be like, to gain more confidence by being able to play the roles as well. Yeah. Mm. Where did that amalgamation come into? Where do you think, like, the panto and the stage school outside of school and then the oh, yeah. school life? Because you're Killian, the artist, in these groups, and then you're Killian, the schoolboy, yeah. in these groups. <laughs> like, It's like, it was, it's nearly like two um, different things. The, the, the schoolboy, oh, he's full of confidence. He's all oh, stage, he's all this. But then when I'm, when I'm there on stage and out of school, I'm different. <laughs> yeah. You know? Where do you think the intersection was? Where did you meet yourself halfway? Because that's a very that's a very draining thing mm. to be two separate people in one life. Do you're you not Hannah Montana and you're not freaking Miley Cyrus. No, I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> um, do you know what? It's the interesting uh, fact as well and story is that even when I finished school, my school principal is involved in theatre in their hometown as well. So I kind of, when I finished school, I kind of got the experience. I was like, do you know what? I'm going to go there and I'm going to, and I got to play a big role in a production out there as well. Yeah. So, do you know, I kind of, I took, I love my hometown and whatever like that, but I, I still had to kind of escape from my hometown to to grow as a performer you as well. You need to leave your home to find yourself. Mm -hmm. <laughs> How deep and profound is that that's it where do you believe it was that a crucial piece of guidance came that supported you do you have a mentor or was there a moment in time where you were like okay i can do this i can be this person i just need to find myself hmm for a lot of not just theater practitioners but for a lot of men in general it's a case of they might have interests outside of what they 
think is acceptable and without us all being Zac Efron and Troy Bolton wanting to sing and also play basketball for people in the arts who also feel that they need to be another person around their family or their friends or their school it's very hard to try and not only accept themselves but to show themselves to everyone so where do you think you found that moment in time where you were like I'm going to be my own person do you know what uh, sure when, when I think about it looking back going growing up and you never think about all that like you know at the, the time last, you don't no. no and I think there wasn't really talk of mental health mental health now it's in the last like, decade or 10 years now that we hear about mental health so me even growing up as a teenager you know like what's that <laughs> um and it was even like the best thing for your mental health as well um is to journal everything like you know your thoughts and the journals that you hate doing the journals that i hate doing <laughs> well like if I, it's shakespeare journals are different when when it's about your personal life and then if you're working in theater but i just feel like you know if i was a teenager and if i was journaling as a teenager You'd nearly get slagged or like, mm-hmm. oh, diary. Like, pure, do you know, it you was such diary? a diary. Gr- you have a diary. It was oh such a gr- fucking pussy. Do you know, yeah. back then, years yeah. ago, like, it was such a, a girly thing to do. Yeah. So there was no, like, oh, boys have diaries. Like, you have a diary. Like, you know what I mean? No, it's a journal. It's not a diary. <laughs> yes. Yeah, 100%. So, so, yeah, I just, um, I just feel like having, having a journal or a diary now is just, it's just the, just the best thing to have, really, to let things go. Um, so when when you mentioned about like any mentor or stuff like that, there was always times um, if I was in a performance, or whatever, I'd always get someone that was experienced or doing it for years, like saying like, like, uh, did I remember? God love him now. God rest his soul. I remember. Um, when I got the part a small part of a small farmer um, I was took aside by the late John Finn and he literally took took me aside and went through the dialogue and put on the farmer's accent and so on like that as well the farmer in Snow White yeah. with <laughs> Sarah Allen as Snow White and Nastasia Vasco mm-hmm. and Tim Cusack and John Finn. Um, for anyone that doesn't know, John Finn is a stalwart of the Limerick theatre community. He is a great man, a great artist, and he will always be in our hearts. But um, he has influenced sure. so many people. Uh, the fact, the straight, the, the fact when you said like farmer, I was like, he's going to talk about Snow White. He's going to talk about <laughs> John Finn taking him aside. Oh, yeah. So. To have people like that that will take their time and give it to you the younger generation because they know they can help you along in your journey is quite an immense thing for sure so to john like taking a moment away from this podcast just thank you and to the finn family sandra breed katrina sean everyone just wow Killian is after kicking me under the table, and Mike Finn, I also give respect to you as well, as part of the Finn family. But we're going to move into social media, and the world's like heavily influenced by social media, and what comparison for young people often experience the pressures and feelings of inadequacy. How can being creative be a positive way to create a self-image or to practice self-love despite external noise. Let's say this whole curated sense of you need to be the perfect person online. What advice would you give or offer to someone to help them stay true to themselves? Well, first of all, Stuart, um, me growing up as a young person, teenager, never had social media (laughs) because once upon a time social media wasn't a thing. Well, I don't want to show our age, but Google was only invented in the early 2000s Killian mm-hmm. so <laughs> and there was still no such thing as social media back then oh, stop man we are old yeah um but me now even as a 31 year old man I have to sit and remember you know sometimes behind 
being behind the phone or being behind the camera for anyone that's if they're advertising something or if they're promoting something they're putting on a smile they're it's like putting on an act on the camera but um so that person alone they're probably suffering inside themselves and we don't know that do you know it's like being on stage or being in front of the camera it's all an act you put it on so we don't know these people's struggles as well so my advice to young people is you know take the take what you get from it um don't put yourself down don't be don't put it into a negative situation take some positives but remember that you know behind behind it all those people could be suffering as well yeah that is very profound mm. I don't know if anyone actually realizes this but I only got into theater making and theater practice because of this fecker sitting across from me <laughs> Genuinely, one day I had this chap come up to me and say, do you want to audition for a show? And myself and my best friend, we both said, yeah, sure, why not? We didn't realize it was a panto. It was a fairy tale. And we, not wanting to be in fairy tales and wanting to be in massive big costumes and lives, just said, we're going to take the mickey out of everyone in this room. And next thing we know... We're cast and nearly 20 years down the line, we are still in it because we love the community that it was made. But it, it, it just, sorry, the, it, it deviates from our last question and falls into our next question about connection and how it's so fundamental, not only for personal development, but a human need in each person, especially for young individuals. Me, I was a very lost young man and you, being this very like energetic individual <laughs> coming into my life and saying you need to come here on this Sunday just to talk in front of this person and see what happens it, it changed my life it's like a butterfly wow. effect <laughs> honestly Killian it did like we didn't know each other yeah at all so understanding and support how can one build a strong support system that nurtures their mental health and well-being from art it's a very introspective question. I'm sorry, well, but I know. But what I'm going to take from that now, and what I'm going to tell you as well, um, with theatre, it's um, you, you. You can tell a story. You can tell any story in theatre. You can put, um, you can put anything onto the stage. So what? It, that's one of the main things. What I love about um, theatre is you can find a topic, and showcase that topic, and that's when, you know. When an audience comes and watches that piece, they're like, oh, that's familiar. <laughs> you know what I mean? And that's what I love. And that's the power of theatre as well. And, you know, again, community and theatre, you know, it's the bond. Everyone, it's like a family. So a community and theatre is like a family. Very toxic family at times when you're both going for the same roles and you're like, <clears throat> F him for getting that. I know, me. but for example, like, um, you know community theatre and studying theatre as well like you know I, I I spent years doing community theatre as well but when I when I went to college to study theatre I learned so much about myself as well and I learned about knowing that the type of actor that I am the type of characters I can play and when I realised that then as well it really helped in the audition process as well because knowing the type of characters I was able to play when we got the script I read the script and I saw I'm going to go straight into the audition and I'm going to focus on these two characters and I'm going to play these two characters and because these two characters they were the type of characters that I can play as a person Were they characters you could play or characters you could connect to in that space and time? Because all the world's a stage. You can play any character in any way, shape, or form. We can all play the hero. We can all play the masochist and the villain mm. at some point because we've all felt that. But finding connection. Well, you know what? No, Stuart, all the parts that I have played have been older men. <laughs> they've been they've been dark. They've been um, royal. They've been... <laughs> what does that say about you as a person? 
doctors. Um, you know, I suppose for me as a person, as you were saying earlier on, like, you know, I'm pure. I'm out there. I'm like, oh, come to this, do this. But I'm, I, I find myself very. Um, I can, I can be very serious as well. Do you know, I, I know, I know to, when there's a time and place. I know my p's and q's. And you can be very commanding, very, especially on the stage. You can draw attendance. I can be very reserved as well. You know what I mean. So I think me being a very reserved kind of person, play the mature. I could be. I could play the mature person mm-hmm. by being reserved. So maybe that's the connection. <laughs> Finding the connection with the character, but being able to cultivate a community or even introduce people to community is a big thing. Like mm-hmm. I was saying, you introduced me to this whole wider community than what I was used to. And you kind of threw me down a path I never intended to go down. Well, how do you... How do you try and draw people in to that community nowadays? Because back then it was a case of we were we were young lads and you were like, we need other boys to be in this show. Mm-hmm. How would you draw people into the theater community? Not so much that we need more male bodies, but a case that it can help you develop as a person. Because in all fairness, theater is a great way not only to express yourself but to look into yourself and to find yourself Mm -hmm. i would not be the same man i am if i didn't perform would you be the same person you are if you didn't perform no i wouldn't no who do you think because i do feel that theater really did boost my confidence to be honest so that was a big drive in in my own personal life as well Mm -hmm. you know but going back to the just to finish off the community and when I was in college we all played every the group of us the whole cast each role of it's we all suited each character and we were so serious about it we were so professional about it every night we we got sent in ovations full houses and it, it was so powerful because we all worked so close together and the performances only went on for four nights and at the end of it we were emotionally drained we were bawling crying we loved each other so much and that's that's a family like a community it goes back to the family like you were saying you know what i mean and it's we all like you know there's many like and being in theater as well like you know i'm going into the topic now of straight men gay men whatever like that and i've worked um when i was studying theater as well it's not all gay men there's so many straight men involved in theater as well and because we're like a family we're so like a unit it's even we're all comfortable in each other's skin Mm. and you know each other's skin or your own skin a fist pump and like well done we were all so proud of each other you know and the lads would be hugging each other sexuality doesn't come into play not at all not You're a all. person, an individual. For sure. And you can be yourself as that individual. Absolutely. Absolutely. Why do you think we can't find that in other aspects of life that is not part of the arts? I'm going to definitely point towards sports because I remember my dad personally wanting me to be such a rugby lad, mm-hmm. doing it for like so many years, and it absolutely mentally and emotionally destroyed me. And it destroyed a relationship with my father, who was a very man's man. Mm hmm until we created that connection again but like why can't we have that in other aspects of life or is it down to the individual and the community like the small communities in general like familial or parental i think it's definitely down to the individual but like growing up now and me being older i think generations and things have changed now in life and even so many like once upon a time I was 14, 15 short. Where are you? I was, where are you? No, wait, wait. <laughs> I'm pure like open, like words are coming out of my mouth. But um, I was wearing skinny jeans. Oh, I'd, I'd be slagged and bullied for wearing skinny jeans. And I can tell you now, straight away, that there's, there's boys in sport wearing tighter pants than skinny jeans back when I was 15. 
And no one um, bats an eyelid. No, not at all. Not, Do you know what not I mean? now these days, no. No. And then. Fashion or jewellery as well, completely fashion and changed. Jewelry, um, I did a b- bit of barbering for a while, a number of years ago. And being in the barbers, there was a long tin of hairspray in the barbers. And when when the change came in, like the barber had that whole tin of hairspray for like a year inside inside um, in the barber shop. And all of a sudden, Do you remember in the Georgia? space of two months, the whole tin of hairspray w- went. And now lads, after getting their hair cut, some lads ask to put the hair gel or the hairspray in themselves <laughs> yeah because they know what they want do you remember the you know. do you remember the influx of jersey and geordie shore and the hairspray and the lads with like the quiffs and the mm. comment i just literally looked on the table and we're both wearing extremely skinny skin jeans yeah and to be honest in the gym this morning i was wearing like very very tight runner's pants and i'm just thinking yeah how like fashion has changed and the perspective of what masculinity mm-hmm. is has completely changed because for men like uh you can do whatever you want now with your of body course. and look a certain way and that doesn't have anything to do with like your sexuality and i th- and i think the the whole color thing as well like there's so many lads now wearing pink <laughs> you can get a full pink uh tracksuit in the menswear i in... have two pink suits upstairs yeah i have two pink suits that i will happily wear to any event <laughs> i was joking there one day because i got a big bright full purple tracks or uh, full purple pink purpley pink tracksuit and i just had it in my head i'm like walking through town and, and someone looked I, I never said it out loud but i'm like i got it in the men's apartment <laughs> you, you know what i mean <laughs> do you want to know what the worst thing is now whenever I go into TK Maxx I usually saunter around the women's department before I go into the men's because I'm like I like their fashion a lot Mm -hmm. more and their style and like all these flows fashion is a construct wear what you want it's basically we're saying be as comfortable as you want in pursuit of like passions and dreams it's often intertwined with your mental well-being and we're talking about being comfortable within how you look how you feel about yourself but what advice would you give to young people, young artists who face discouragement or double standards along the way of a creative journey? You were talking about how you find a community in the school aspect of performing, in the stage school aspect, and in the college aspect, you found that true familial um, construct because you're all there to perform. Mm-hmm. How can we give that to a wider audience who are just coming into this it's a very hard thing because they are still being bombarded with so many different avenues of life I think and another thing I'm going to say as well for something like that and it's the likes of us Stuart I feel that we have to offer more of that inner and no matter where, no matter where you are in your hometown it's still a lot of home places are still old fashioned, still have the same template for years. And now that now that I feel getting older and we see that, I think now it's now there's the platform I think, do you know what? I'm going to offer this now. Cause I would love to see that I'd love to see that happen. You like, work so much with the schools now in general. Like you're sure. a director, you're a choreographer, you're a stage manager for like all these school shows. I've done drama workshops with TY as well. Yeah. You know, and <laughs> some days it could be very difficult because the boys they just they they, they, they need they, to they're be boys. laughing they're they're laughing they're like not taking it serious and Josh and being lads lads yeah <laughs> yeah <laughs> but I think it's definitely a platform that needs to be brought out there more you know what I mean do you know in America they actually have curriculum where it's theater practice. Mm-hmm. You will study theater and acting and all this, and you will get credits for it. Why do you think that's not brought into, um, I want to say European schools, but I can't speak for anything outside of Ireland. Why do you think it's not here in Ireland? Well, it's almost here, I think, anyway. Drama is definitely, it's like PE as well. I think PE is starting to come in for the leaving certs, and, and drama, I think, is really starting to come in now as well. Do you think so? Have you seen it in schools? Watch, watch the space. Um, not not with schools anyway. In general, there not is yet. Um, 
like you know drama studies the drama studies like you know the like mm. you know it, there's music in schools now and everything you do music exams and stuff but at the moment with schools like you know you you do your um school show or a school play or when i was doing the when i was doing the drama workshops there recently in a school that was all part of a cultural week so they done a bit of tv and film they done stage i was doing the drama as well like, you know what i mean but um it's definitely there has been like drama and education programs now starting to come out now as well and i definitely think it's going to be part of a school curriculum yeah do you think we need more of those types of arts incorporated into our i don't want to say younger generations because i always feel like we're the older more decrepit people and we're not we're still young we're feisty we're we're energetic but with the development of god i have to say the younger generation the arts is such a leeway for people to find themselves a lot quicker than growing 10 years of walking through the mist as we have done Mm -hmm. yeah do boys cry like are we allowed to cry absolutely why why should we cry we're the men we're the caregivers the as i say things things have changed like and i've I've actually witnessed um through theater like you know i've i've witnessed um you know they're a sporty person and their first time ever on stage and then the last night you know they had tears coming out of their eyes and and that was an uh, that was another reason why that was my first uh school production me like working on a school show and when i saw that i was like yes i definitely want to do this seeing things like that kind of like you know let's do school productions we can make grown men cry i know but like you know it's it's something that um (laughs) it's their first time experiencing it and that overwhelming sense of emotion absolutely yeah you know do we need that do we need to be um like open to those types of feelings at such a young age for sure like you know it's we have to um we have to express ourselves anyway and we can't be bottling things up you know what i mean so it's definitely just to release it all out you know happy tears sad tears (laughs) between the tears how can we stay focused to maintain a healthy mindset because like being bombarded with so many emotions as a performer, you allow yourself to feel not only your own feelings, but the character's feelings in that mm-hmm. particular moment in time. As a younger person, you're feeling not only your own feelings, that particular character in time, and also everything else you're developing. And then on top of all that, be you an adult, a youth, adolescent, you're also going to feel the trials and tribulations of life. How can you maintain a healthy mindset whilst being a narcissist in any way, shape or form, no matter what level your career starting or being a stalwart? Um, You know, Stuart, uh, for for what I do now, if I'm sorry, I didn't like I never even thought about doing it years ago. And so if I was a teenager, if if I was to say to, to my teenage self, what I'm doing now I'm like yeah I, sh- I should definitely do that so what I would say is like you know the meditation or the journal writing things down I'm sorry I didn't do that as a teenager to be honest um I need to show you my journals after this mm, <laughs> you know and what way will I say it? obviously I'm not asking you to make a hazard but write things down and set it up my light <laughs> well no <laughs> and as an older person obviously but no just write things down and take time out for yourself you know you we all everything is all such a high 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 but we need to calm down we need to sit back relax take it all in and reflect and i would love to i'd love to see what i would have been like if i'd done that as a teenager Do you mm-hmm. know i think 
will a lot of the fear and, ex- and anxiety not be severe if I done all that? Because, you know, writing things down and meditating, that would reduce and take away a lot of anxiety and stuff like that. Do you think so? 100%. Then can I ask you a question? For everything you've been through in your life, all the trials, the trauma, the tribulation, would you change any of it? But if you were to change something, it would change the person you are today. Can you think of a moment in time that you wish never happened? But if that never happened, then everything, every day, every second, every year afterwards, never happened. And that means you would not be sitting in front of me today. This isn't my question. This is um, from um, a very influential person called Mo Gawat. And he says, who would you be if you weren't you? You know what? Um... I'm I'm not too sure really but I can tell you one thing that I did a lot of overthinking um, as a young person and you know I, with overthinking I'm like I'm thinking with other people like oh they're talking about me behind my back they, they probably weren't <laughs> but that's that was always in my in my brain like you know what I mean and that that would take a lot out of me as well that spotlight effect you think other people are looking at you and when they look at you they're judging you and when they judge you they're constantly talking about you i I felt that for a long long time Hmm. so if i if i was aware of it back then and if i the young person i'm not saying back then or back in our day as well like you know there was no mental health there was no nothing about this i didn't really know about oh you should do meditation there was none of that ever said to me or the people that did say it you were thinking no that's not for me that's yeah. that's too out there I think that would have really made me relax a bit yeah. and I think it would have made me relaxed and it would have stopped the overthinking and I think if I had that maybe I could have been the person that got to as a young person maybe I could I would have got all those parts or that I had a speaking part growing up when I didn't you know? but, but you're still so phenomenally talented. Like I will never sing in a room with you. Like you are so <laughs> god genuinely, you are you are such a talented performer. But and I hate to make this very personal, like the only shows we ever performed were Panto together. Mm-hmm. I never was able to be near you or in a room with you because I always felt you were judging me. What? <laughs> you and your group of friends well, i always felt like the outcast in the panto. and i asked you to join and you're the, you're the one who introduced me to panto and yeah. i always felt it was like yeah i'm on the outside always looking oh, in oh no see this is what i mean earlier yeah. on about the whole social media thing you don't know what other people are going no. through do you know what i mean so and then i was, never thought about that let me tell you i was thinking what people were thinking about me so. and it's crazy the spotlight effect for you yeah. is different from the one for me and we both think each other is like thinking of the other person and judging and commenting mm-hmm. on them and it, it never really happened no. but we weren't comfortable enough in ourselves to acknowledge it and try and process it at the time mm-hmm. it's a it's a very toxic cycle to get out of this is a and that's a very interesting thing like now that we are aware of that and know that we can't go back and say that exactly. to ourselves back we can, then. We can never change that. No. Could you imagine if we had a friendship back then? What would it be like? Killian, what are you doing? I don't know, Stuart. Shut up. Just learn the dance moves. I, <laughs> for the record, anyone who is listening, I never learned the dance moves for any of the performances that I had to dance because I was always in the back row and I was very comfortable in saying... There is someone much better in front of me. I don't need to try as hard. Uh, Yeah. It's crazy. That kind of commentary, isn't it? Because mm. like you were always so talented. You were always one of the ones who would get the mic and get the role instantaneously when you walked in the room. I didn't feel like that, though. (laughs) Did you not? No. Really? No, because I always had so, so many. There's, you know. I, you I, have been through what in the last five years alone? You have finished college. You've done like 
over in England this study and you have gone internationally. I lived in London for a month to, to be an entertainer in Spain, yeah, but I can tell you, Stuart, I haven't I haven't really been my true performer self in my own hometown yet, I feel. And, you know, going back to fear and everything like this, when I, the last few times I performed in my hometown, I was over thinking everything things happened on stage I mortified myself live on stage um, did you ever rip your pants on stage and have the granny in the front row go he's not wearing any boxers well I can t- I was wearing boxers by the way granny if you're ever watching this sorry go on well it wasn't ripped shorts but what I can tell you was that in hello dolly being the waiter the big dance hello dolly number the apron and the moustache all fell off. Um, that was one time. Then there was another time when I was a waiter with fake plastic wine glasses with blue tack stuck on the tray. And the blue and tack the, didn't stick and the And they all piece. fell. Um, that's happened. Um, Someone sabotaged you. Um, also on stage, embarrassing, um, where I was a king and literally called... My son, the prince, I literally, my daughter, uh, uh, son, that's the way I was on stage and things like that. Re- I'd run off the stage and I'm like, <gasps> I would choke. Um, everything that has all happened to me in my hometown. Uh, also my hometown, the last, the last adult production I'd done in the musical society, when I had that bit of singing role, m- my anxiety, everything, um, I was kind of off with the time of the music and I was overthinking and I went into a mood of like, I know it, I know it. Da, 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 da. And I was telling everyone like, I can't do it. I, I, I can't do it. Like, uh, but I, my brain was like, I can't do it. And I was going into a mood. I was angry with myself and they all saw that and that embarrassed me. Um, because you're in your hometown. And then also there was a time when I was, we did a, a competition a uh, show competition a number of years ago and I had a solo part in the, it was a big chorus number and there was a few of us like five of us in the front row and there was a, a section in the song where I got a singing piece and once upon a time I did have the habit without even realising when I was singing my hand was kind of moving or rocking and the choreographer from the audience I'll chop off that hand. I was listening to that. Or if you do that one more time, I'm taking it off you. So I've been through. <laughs> I've been through all that. And but you're saying if your hometown. That's happened in my hometown. So I've never. Like, you know, since I've finished college now, since I've been the performer. um, Like, you know, I performed last week in my hometown and there was two or three people there that I was like oh I didn't expect them to be there and they were like it's my first time here and you're saying oh my god and I was like thank you (laughs) you know what I mean why does this section of the world this tiny little speck on a tiny little island on a tiny little peninsula in this corner of Europe matter so much Mm -hmm. no 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 genuinely like if you think that all these moments are like flubs and they're they're, they're what happened to like so many performers in every aspect in every life it's embarrassing and you think you'd never get anything because of those situations that happened you know and that whole like my the prince my my son my daughter I haven't done a, a show with him since <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean <laughs> was this Cinderella mm-hmm. I'm, I'm going to call it out Cinderella oh Limerick Panto when oh, I Limerick fell Frickish. on stage during the finale yeah but you, your character you were able to get away with it I fell flat on my face this is the this is the show that I ripped my pants and the grandmother thought I wasn't wearing underwear in the front row jo- yeah um, screw the aspect of like holding one certain area higher than anything else still in my brain though I was able to tell you about that and that was 2015 you're showing our age again stop yeah. showing our age man <laughs> It's it's these moments that we kind of hold on to for no way, shape or form than just to say we can do better than this at some point. Yeah, mm, for sure. Have you done better than that? Have you stopped calling your son, your daughter? Have you stopped dropping your wine glasses? I have. Tell us about Spain. 
Like that must have been some experience. And challenging. Challenging. Oh, oh yeah. Oh, because all I saw was like the singing oh, videos it, it and was the highlights. Brilliant. But highlights. Day, daytime was activities and host and table quiz master and the whole lot every day. Aqua fitness in the pool. Performing at night. <laughs> but it was the whole rehearsal process. Um, four weeks. That like, must have been intense. The productions are an hour long. One production alone would have like nine costume changes in the one hour show and it was four main productions and we had four weeks in the studio so it was one show a week a week and then by Wednesday you had to have it all off and then by Wednesday they're telling you listen to next week's show and do 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 <laughs> you know I was like oh my god I gave you the not so much a crash course and what it's like to be on a professional like West End Broadway theatrical stage but it was definitely For a sure. crash course in we're gonna do so many things in one space that when anything comes your way it will not phase you anymore yeah because it was a West End choreographer and everything so I remember you telling me this mm. so where did you mess up during this that's now stuck with you when I say mess up I mean where did you learn during this Oh my god, it was exhausting. I was falling asleep on the tube home. Um, <laughs> <laughs> do you know what? It, it's going to happen. Do you know? It's like a big build up. Like, you're, I'm always going to, I feel like I'm always going to have a build up when it comes to something anyway. But when it happens, it happens. You know, I could, I could be doing something and I'm like obsessing about it. And when it's done, it's done. I'm like, it happened. <laughs> You know what I mean? So. <laughs> so, going away from the community aspect, someone who does want to be a performer, what advice would you give them when they want to audition for stage schools, for community theatre, for professional theatre, for theatrical institutions? What would you give the young performer today? What would be a massive help um, if the group or stage school, if they tell you have this prepared or have that prepared, it's not a big, huge thing, but do. This is going to be the musical practitioner practitioner um, goes up against the theatrical practitioner right now. We have two different sides of the same stage about to give advice. You'd say have... Well, like I'll tell, you, and don't over panic anyway, because myself, like I had an audition last week, and I was given the script and everything a week before, but I didn't learn off the script. But I, I read the script, and I was still able to have it in my hand, but I was able to kind of still be confident and look up. So never fear that you actually have to have all this text learned off. You just have to be familiar with it. Um, but singing wise as a singer musical theatre like you know know the song anyway you know what I mean but always pick a always pick a song that you're comfortable with or know because what made what made the audition easier for me last week was out of the two songs I picked one that I completely knew so I didn't have to spend a lot of time on it but I spent more time focusing on the other song so this is when I say be prepared it's such a big help and it would make a difference. For your repertoire, mm -hmm. you can just pull something out. And that would actually be my advice because I had an audition there last week where I had the sides, exact same as you as a script. I, I learned what I needed, but I didn't learn the whole thing. Mm -hmm. So I was comfortable with it. But then all of a sudden they just asked, you know, can you give us a monologue? And I was able to pull something out that I was comfortable that I just had in my back pocket. Mm -hmm. When you want to go for something in the arts, always have one or two pieces that you are comfortable to have at the drop of a hat. And you'll be surprised how many times it will save you in terms of an audition or a callback. Because it not only shows, you know, your range, it will show the fact that you're dedicated. For sure. Am I correct in saying that? Absolutely, 100%. And, you know, because... Even when I was in college, you know, you had to learn so much. And I 
and I had to I had so little time as well to learn these pieces but when I think about it now for, I'm not going to remember them straight away I'm going to have to go back over them I'm going to have to read them again but then they will they will kick in but you have to remind me now I actually have to go over some stuff <laughs> just to have that? just to have them like you know how many times are we talking about self tapes now as well I know let's, let's have a quick conversation about those mm, I hate them <laughs> You hate them. Yeah. I love them. Mm. Why do you hate them? Um, I'm about to do a whole series on social media about self-taping, so I'd love your perspective. Again, for me, it was fear. Um, you know, a small, simple email of bullet points of what you need to do. I'd over panic and think it's even bigger than what it needs to be. Um, yeah, it's just me being judgmental of myself or you know if I'm on my own I'm just pressing the play on the camera myself I'm like did I get it did I do you know what I mean how do you find about the fact that you can press play and then press pause and then restart the whole thing if you don't like it it's not an initial audition with everyone sitting in front of you you have that one power I right. feel I feel like though that any any time when I have recorded a self tape I try just to go from start to finish and not edit a thing. Okay. You know what I mean? The only time I'd edit if it's sectioned, you know, introduction is section, then your piece. Oh yes. You know, there the that's the only time you'd see me edit. Okay. Cuz even for a singer though as well, it's best if if you have to sing on camera Sing the whole song. Singing is you completely can't, different. You yeah. can chop and change. <laughs> you know what I mean? Unless you have multiple cameras for the one take. <laughs> yeah. That I get. As a as a theatre practitioner, I love trying to self-tape and developing the character beforehand. Taking a take, retaking a take, and then trying to create that little... Even that 20 seconds for the audition piece... Mm. But then developing on something and creating my own piece. I put up something recently on social media where I put on a full thing of makeup. I put on a set of The Tempest Ariel. Mm -hmm. That was for an audition, I think, maybe six or seven months ago. Oh, wow. And I did the piece. And then like three hours afterwards, I took my camera and I was like, I'm going to do the full full scene. Mm -hmm. And I just created this one thing, not only to develop on a self-tape, but to develop on my my craft as a singer you must do that constantly maybe not with self-tapes but you're constantly practicing practicing you're vocal warm-ups tuning sure, yeah vocal warm-ups tell me about those because my car would if, if my car had ears it would hate me <laughs> anytime i drive a vocal warm-up a trill you know trying to work on my vibrato mm-hmm. i'm still very flat and pitchy all the time but like what do you do for vocal warm-ups to get yourself comfortable I always, um, even when I was when I was performing in Spain as well, every night, without fail, performance there was a vocal warm up, and myself and the girls we would through the rehearsal process every morning we we done vocal warm ups with our musical director and we recorded them. Vocal warm ups with the musical director and then the the hosting and then the aqua aerobics and then the performance jesus okay Mm. dang um and every night without fail our sound check you know with a sound check oh do this do this we're finished our sound checked we done a full run through of the show without costume change though did we do we did do it with costumes as well (laughs) yeah yeah it's 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 those one hour productions are so scary because they were so scary because it's so hot and there's only three of us um if and one it was thing challenging goes wrong as well because sees. it's a three-piece harmony like i was the oh. only male vocal line so i had a harmony the girls had a harmony um and the challenging thing is changing your costumes because if the girls are on stage singing i'm getting changed if i'm on stage they're getting changed it's all boom 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 boom, boom, boom. behind stage or would you have time to go to like a dressing room or a different room our dressing room was literally behind the curtain <laughs> so but the, we had little we had a stage anyway we had our own dressing rooms at the side ah those little wings on the side of the mm. stage 
yeah do you ever remember and i know i'm going back to panto now when um the two sisters in you did beauty and the beast did you I did. the first beauty and the beast yeah, with emma driscoll and um micheline yeah I was, as the, i was the butcher you were do you ever remember the two sisters getting changed behind the driver? Sure, this is a podcast. Getting changed? No, like this is theatre. Getting changed on stage behind a screen on the stage. Like literally they would be in their sister's costumes and they, they had to get changed into their BR mm-hmm. guest costume because it was Beauty and the Beast. Literally, it that's the way theatre goes. If you have a screen or a sheet, that is your changing room for the next oh, scene. Oh, absolutely. So it goes in theatre. Yeah. Or um, Sheena Murphy. I love Sheena Murphy. I have had to change on stage behind the set once as well. Oh, did you have a house though? It was a wardrobe. It was the lo- it was Aladdin. So the it was like a it's a great. wardrobe thingy. Oh thingy. gosh. Yeah. I remember one time um, we were doing a show in Thomond Park, and I was wearing Miles Breen's shirt. Now, Miles Breen is about four sizes smaller than me, so I felt very bulky and big and strong in that shirt until I realized my wrists didn't fit into the sleeves. Mm. So trying to get it off was terrible. And then Sheena Murphy had to basically strip me side of the stadium and change me because I wasn't able to do it myself. It's it's crazy what you do for theater. That is show business. How can you stay focused and maintain a healthy... Sorry, we went so off topic, but how can you stay Name focused? Name dropping the whole lot. <laughs> let them. Yeah. Let them. How do you maintain a healthy mindset when pursuing this artistic aspiration? Because like, there's so much that goes into it, not only personally, but then professionally on the outset. And also the stuff you have to do at the time. My best friend is a yoga match as well, by the way. Even when I was... In Spain, before a show, I'd, I'd nearly meditate and lie down on that yoga mat. Yeah. Keep so, yourself grounded. Mm-hmm. Going back to the journaling and trying to ground yourself yep. in the moment. And I did a lot of that on the beach as well, looking up at the moon. Um, in Spain, it was lovely. After a show, before a show? After, yeah. With that energy in you or depleted? Oh, depleted. Just the thing about show business as well, like, you know, you run such a high and then when it's all over, it just drops. What do you mean by high? I'm getting very oh, deep a, again. No, it's a high. It's a buzz like, woo, I'm performing. And then it's over. Bang. Shut. Because you just, it's like. Your movements are very interesting because. <laughs> you're, no, no, I'm no, all no, hands. No, 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 because your hands are going up yeah, as yeah. in you're performing. Whenever I talk about performing, my hands go out. You're talking about your energy goes into the space. I'm talking my energy goes to you. Your energy goes to the audience and you give yourself to the audience and you try to entertain, you try to emote, you try to make them feel. And it does drain the person, the performer, individually. Mm -hmm. And you replenish that by basically, basically stopping and filling your cup again. You look at the moon on a yoga mat at the beach, which sounds beyond picturesque, I must say. Oh, it was lovely. I curl into the fetal position under my bed. <laughs> so everyone for their own, I guess. What closing words would you give or what message of hope and encouragement can we share to individuals who will be listening to this podcast? Wisdom. What would you want to leave people to navigate their journey towards mental well-being in the artistic field, forum, world, this freaking madness of stripping behind the stage, on the stage, while other people are performing into your knickers and into your (laughs) next suit. I would say at all times, be creative. So even if you're going through a period of when you're not performing, if you don't have auditions or if you're feeling like, oh, I'm not getting this, I'm not getting that. Create, 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 make up your own pieces um sometimes i'm like some there was things i you know there's things i want to do in life and there's like you know i I have a bit of event management in the background and i've put on events but i wanted to i wanted to do it and i was saying the only the only way i'm going to get to do it is by doing it myself 
so that's what you have to do um like you know if it's a two minute video do a bit of improv turn on the camera and speak to the camera yourself do you know that's being creative so that's my uh that's my message what advice would you give to gain an agent we had two different experiences gaining an agent. I was rejected by over 50. You got one and like you've been with them ever since. <laughs> well, I have sent messages to other agents and they've never replied. But, um, you know, it's just... Uh, you have build up, build a profile. Um, build your ability build, to showcase someone. Absolutely. How did you get your agent in the end? Like when when did you get your agent? Yeah, should I say it was it was difficult because you know when I graduate, I never got to do my graduation production because we went into lockdown and COVID. But it was all through um, it was all through lockdown and uh, just Ireland I, Irish agents and found the agent and. Trying to find one that would help you in your sphere right now. For, for sure, yeah. Um, and I'm, I'd be lost without my agent. I absolutely... That experience in Spain last year was all thanks to my agent as well. Yeah. Um, yeah, so... When I when I contacted them and everything, I... I wrote a big whole email. <laughs> I've done this, I've done this, I've done this, I've done this. The and spiel with the resume and the headshot and yeah. the little showreel. I'm the exact same in terms of it happened during lockdown. I was trying to develop myself as an artist and I found someone, they connected with me and we've been working together ever since and they've given great opportunities. But you need to be aware of the rejection, don't you? Oh, 100%. It's yeah. just like an audition. Like These people want the best that they want to represent. They want to represent people who are going to work. Mm -hmm. And that's one thing I want to close off with. Talent versus being a hard worker. What do you think? Ooh, that's tough. <laughs> that's a very tough one because you can... I, I think I would... Personally, I... I I consider myself a hard worker anyway and being the hard worker would make myself talented because I suppose I'm doing the work uh -huh. you, you you have to do the work to get the work um so you know it's I've been I've been performing since I was eight years old <laughs> you know so it's just a build-up yeah a build-up of what Performing, performing, performing. Pe I've, your ability. You know, it's not your performance. It's your, your ability. ability as an artist. Yeah. What are you building up, Killian? <laughs> My ability. <laughs> I'm sorry. That's it. <laughs> Everyone, this has been Killian James Fitzgerald. He has come on to talk about the persistence, the living a life of a dream. So, to Killian, I want to say just... Thank you for, thank you for being stolen away, I guess, because this was meant to be online. And then I just, I dragged him to my house and I was like, we're going to do this in person mm -hmm. and just see where it goes. And we had about a, we should have recorded the first 40 minutes of this conversation because it was funny, <laughs> filled with, filled with gossip. But Killian, thank you for coming on the podcast today. Thank you, Stuart. Guys, to everyone, I want to say good morning, good evening, good afternoon, good night, wherever you are in the world. I hope you have a good day, the day you deserve.